be invited to your show. Good job for educating us, educating the public. I also want to wish a happy Mental Health Month to everyone listening because May has been designated a Purple Month. And I'm happy we are talking about mental health. And most importantly, today, we've been given the opportunity to talk about child and adolescent mental health. Um, so let's fire away because we do not have a lot of time. There is so much to say, but I'll try to not to be too boring with whatever I have to present. And then we can have time for uh, people to rather ask more questions so that I can go into the details. So basically, I'm going to introduce um, some definitions to help us to understand who are children, who are adolescents, um, who are early adults, and why it's important we talk about mental health, specifically in this group of people. And we'll try and have a quick overview of the um, common disorders and how we can promote child and adolescent mental health. I'm happy last week, uh, my colleague, Dr. Joa, did uh, a good work um, on maternal mental health and set a good foundation also on some preliminary understanding. So I have a golden question for us all. Maybe some of us can put it in the chat box in um, on YouTube or Zoom. So do children have mental health issues? And why are we talking about them at this point? Um, so yes, you can put in your answer. If you think, oh, children don't have mental health issues and they have nothing to bother or worry about, or if you think they do, and then you can add why. So I think Dr. Sedo here, you can keep track of it if some people are putting in some comments. But there is a common myth that children do not have anything to worry about and probably don't have mental health issues. So um, usually many people do not um, give any priority um, to children's mental health matters. But there is a fact. The fact is that the period of adolescence especially is a critical period for the onset of most mental disorders. And I will elaborate that pretty soon. So then probably it goes back to the question, do children also have mental health issues? A lot, if I should be frank. So just to understand some um, definitions and timings, because who is a child? Who is an adolescent? Um, usually a child is defined by law as an individual below 18 years. And this um, could change per the jurisdiction or country, but most countries still define a child um, as um, an individual below 18 years. And in Ghana, that is also the definition for a child. Now, um, the UNICEF body has come up to help us to understand age categories pertaining to this uh, group of people. So when we talk about an adolescent, so as a child, the whole bracket from zero to 18 years, you're a child. But in between that period, there is a period of adolescence, which is technically defined as those age between 10 to 19 years. Okay, so they are bridging the childhood and the adulthood. They are just inter overlapping between those um, periods. Then we also have a term called the youth. I mean, sometimes we use the word youth. And technically, UNICEF defines at the age of people between 15 to 24 years, and then young persons. So sometimes you can hear the term in, in write-ups, young people, young persons. It's technically also defined as people aged between 10 to 24 years. So um, you can probably find that the youth are embedded in young, young persons or young people. Yes, yeah, so these are the kind of group of people we are talking about today and what is fascinating about this period. So, last week, I know Dr. Atua told a lot about mental health, but I think this, this month is Mental Health Awareness Month, so we'll keep reiterating this um, definition, that mental health is a state of well-being, and so you you got to be well, and you need to find, assess your own self. Am I well? What is my state of well-being? And in mental health, we say the individual must realize his or her own abilities. So as we have this conversation, ask yourself, do I realize my own abilities? Can cope with the normal stresses of life. Day in and day out, we all go through different stresses. Those that we can control and those that we cannot control. For those of us in Ghana, we know a lot of stress that is already 
up and we cannot control. So how do you cope with these stresses of life? Um, mental health means you can work productively and fruitfully and you're able to make contribution to your community. So these uh, come as a reminder to us. So let's keep this in mind and, and deliberate on, ask ourselves questions whether we have the mental health or not. Interestingly, this definition has been further um, tailored to target children and adolescents as well. So there is that, that definition fitting for child mental health. And this is also by the WHO. It says for, for us to say a child has good mental health, the child must have optimal psychological development and functioning. Means the child is developing well, not just in their body, but in their mind and is functioning well. That means a child has a positive sense of self. Um, so you have to check it. Does my child, how does my child see themselves? Their self-image that a child has for, for themselves. Are they having a good self-image? They have a low self-esteem. Um, so these are very important. It means the child has the ability to manage their thoughts, emotions, and build social relationships. You know, when we, um, especially in the period of adolescence, it's a very dicey period where there is a lot of changes and development going on, what we call teenage years. And it's also the time when there is onset of puberty. So there's a lot of hormonal changes and upsage and raging hormones a lot of changes okay for i mean all of us have been children before have reached that stage before and then for those of us who are still children yet to get there um whatever it is it's a, it's a, a critical period and so there are a lot of thoughts that go on there are a lot of changes emotional changes and that's where people want to find their self um, identity want to belong they find people they are interested in they begin to develop sexual feelings for opposite sex and all that so because of um, all these changes it is important they're able to manage that those thought emotions and everything happening to them in their social relationships and that's when we we need to really look critically at the uh, mental health of children and adolescents it also means a child has an aptitude to learn and acquire an education. How is your child performing in school? A lot of the times it uh, gives a pointer to whether uh, the child is having good mental health or not. So uh, when a child is especially poor, uh, performing very poorly in school or not able to learn, we, we, ha we have to check that this child, they have problems with their mental health. And I'm sure some of the other things I'll say later, I'll throw more light on that. And the child should be able to have opportunity to have full participation in society. Okay, so think about this, this the, the definition of child mental health. Now, why do we need to talk about child and adolescent mental health and why do we need to prioritize it? This I cannot over elaborate, but I just put a few pointers here that the period of childhood and adolescence is a critical and vulnerable period. I've said that. To me, I feel that before we start talking about mental health in adults or anybody, we need to start from children because we first become children before we go into adults. So foundations really matter. And whatever you put in today is what you are going to definitely reap tomorrow. So building a good mental health foundation for a child, an adolescent, they will grow with it. And then they will also become well-adjusted adults and individuals. Again, it's a period of a lot of change and development. You know, as soon as you cross the adolescent period, technically, yes, you still go and develop all right. But a lot of the most important um, changes and development or care before adulthood. And so, and especially you know, when we talk about mentally and then our development in our minds, our emotional development and maturity, it's all formed in our early years. So it's important we, we start looking at, it, at the mental health in children and adolescents early. Now it will interest you to know, um, there's a study done by a very renowned scientist um, the the first paper I read of them was in 2003, and over the years, the fact has not changed. It has still been replicated that half of all mental illnesses begin by age 14, yes. And 
three quarter or 75 percent by age 24 years that means that every mental illness that would come majority of them have their onset in the period of adolescence so I don't know how to over elaborate that. It means it's really important that we prioritize child and adolescent mental health. There are adults today who have mental health issues, which we need to go back and we realize that those problems started in adolescence. Is that it just didn't start um when they were adults? Um yes, a few mental illnesses do start um, in adulthood or late adulthood, but those are fewer compared to those that start in adolescence. Again, the statistics show that there are about 1.3 billion adolescents in the world today, and that makes about 16% of the world's population. And that's very significant for us to target them and talk about uh, mental health as adolescents. It's a critical period for as to institute preventive measures. And because it's generally underserved, we need to prioritize it now. So yes, I could go over and on and on and on. So let's um, look at just a few st interesting statistics. Um, it's interesting and saddening to know that, you know, a lot of sicknesses and conditions, physical conditions, um, targets, and adults old age and then that leads to high mortality or people dying but we ask ourselves what will make a child or adolescent die and it's interesting to know that some mental health challenges here we have um sorry i was looking for my pointer but again, okay there's my pointer so here we have um suicide highlighted in red and it's the fourth leading cause of death among uh, adolescents aged 15 to 19. And this is for males, boys. In girls, it is the third leading cause of death. If you look at the first three, suicide. And suicide is a very important mental health issue. Um, even in the, in the male gender, there's interpersonal violence, the second uh, leading cause of death among adolescents. And if you go in, I mean, the personal violence still boils down to mental health issues okay, leading to all those violence. So, because we we'll we we'll, we'll look at problems like conduct disorders and you'll see how it's, it's, it's it actually also causes a lot of deaths. Therefore, it's very important to take mental health among adolescents seriously. The WHO instituted the Mental Health Action Plan. This is even passed from 2013 to 2020, where it said that I mean, we have child health, but it's realized that there can be no child health without child mental health. And therefore, we need to incorporate mental health into care, into child health care, where we should look at promotion, prevention. That is very important that there are some problems that we should, we can prevent, even so that they don't develop into disorders or mental ill health. And those who are ill, we need to treat them, help them to recover, rehabilitate when needed so let me just go do a quick overview um i i was a little bit um confused how to handle all these because they are all interesting and then we need to know them but i'll try and make a uh, general overview and then we can ask specific questions related to them so what are the conditions or disorders that affect the mental health of children and adolescents? Anxiety disorders. Okay, so I brought that first because we'll see soon that it is the commonest uh, mental health issue among children and adolescents. Um, a lot of the times we overlook it because we don't know. And I'm sure that's why this education is important. And we have mood disorders like depression, um, bipolar disorders, so conditions that affect the mood. Then we have the contact disorders that affect behavior and how um, people behave, react, how they obey or break laws. We have a uh, almighty attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, what is commonly known as ADHD. And we have autism spectrum disorders, intellectual development disorder, which is also called mental retardation specific learning disorders like dyslexia, okay, children who 
who have difficulty reading and writing and other challenges with learning. Some may have problems with learning, math, writing. So that's the names here. We have eating disorders and, of course, psychotic disorders, substance use disorders, and suicide. Um, I would use my friends here just to give through um, light on the common ones. Then I'll go to the ones that probably are not too common. So for depression, you see, I don't know how to name this animal, <laughs> but he looks quite having a droopy face and sad. And as for depression, I know uh, at least a lot of us have knowledge about depression, but we have been concerned with depression in adults, maternal depression. Last week, I believe we heard more about depression in mothers. Um, there's also depression in children. And I think I'll say a little to that. You see Mr. Piggy here, anxious, um, always worrying, always thinking or afraid of something. Yeah, then you see Pooh Bear here, who seems too full and uh, probably overweight and unable to get up. So especially in adolescence, we have eating disorders where you can overeat or undereat. And it's usually due to self-image distortions or body image distortions where people don't like how they look. And even when they look okay, they think they don't look okay, they should grow thinner. Or because of some psychological issues, they just eat and overeat and binge eat and then they become obese. You see Mr. Tiger here with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which is which I will elaborate a little on. And probably this is the squirrel with obsessive compulsive disorder. And um, it's probably something that we we'll have to have a special day to talk about, but it's also a common disorder in adolescents. And psychotic disorders like schizophrenia, where the child or adolescents can lose touch with reality. And then you find a child talking to themselves, talking to unseen beings, um, or having certain beliefs that sound weird or that sound un untrue or unreal. And it's all because the mind has developed a problem or a disorder. So let's see. Um, yes, yeah, so again, global statistics have showed that anxiety and depressive disorders are the highest um, in terms of the common mental disorders in boys and girls aged 10 to 19 years. So this is typically adolescents. And again, even some studies uh, on a small scale done in our own um, setting like Ghana and other places which have incorporated younger children have also showed um, anxiety as even the first commonest and depressive disorder. So I would like to touch even more on that. Co conduct disorders, are really common and I would just talk a bit on it because I'm sure people don't know that sometimes what we call children are too stubborn or they are breaking too much rules or doing what um, is, is going uh, beyond control is all, all conduct disorders that's that are mental health issues or mental disorders that need attention. So don't you say my, my child is too stubborn. A, a lot of um the those that have progressed to become criminals in our society and have to be incarcerated or be face the law have suffered conduct disorders as as children and adolescents, but because there were no interventions, they grew up with um, some of personality, which we call antisocial personalities. They become thieves, robbers, and they engage in all kind of, kinds of social analysis. And that's, that's all points to the fact that there was some problem or disorder as children or adolescents. ADHD also really commented commonest intellectual disability and the others that we also uh, try to talk about a bit. Okay, so this is just some quick overview. For depression, I know at least the word itself, sometimes because of its use in the English language, but medically we diagnose and we say that the person has a depressive disorder. So it could be a major depressive disorder based on what um, 
diagnostic criteria the clinician will use. So depression, not just as a lay English term, but it is a diagnosable mental health condition, which is also commonly diagnosed in adolescents, especially. I've even had a few children below age 10 who were depressed or who had significant clinical depression. So things like feeling sad, in children, you may not find a typical low mood. You may find that they are rather irritable. That means they are just easily angered or on the edge. You find that that's not how your child is, but they have become so irritable. could be that they are depressed. They begin to decline maybe a bit in their, in their learning or their academic performance because depression can make them have problems with concentration and memory can make them feel worthless, guilty, especially adolescents, and suicide because depression is one of the commonest reasons why uh, adolescents may become suicidal. You might you may also observe in your child that they have sleep disturbances. In in children and adolescents, um, typically you may even find that they are oversleeping instead of having um, poor or little sleep, whereby in adults, most of the time, they have insomnia or what. Um, it's more of lack of sleep but sometimes in children they may have a lack of sleep or they actually may have an adolescent may who is depressed may just spend all their days sleeping sleeping because they don't they don't have any drive to attend to whatever they need to attend to appetite to be disturbed they may gain or lose weights and then even with their movements it may become slower than usual okay so Let's look at anxiety. So we said anxiety is very common in both children and adolescents. In the younger children, they can be anxious about many things. Now, see anxiety as um, a kind of fear. Okay, and this fear, a lot of the times, may be unwarranted um, because you're anticipating something bad to happen, but... Everything is fine actually around you, yet you are in a state where the mind seems to think that something bad is going to happen. You are just worrying about so many things. So there's just um, a few broken down ways where a child can be anxious. Um, it's It can express itself both in the mind, in the thoughts, worrying thoughts all over in the head or in the it can actually anxiety can appear with physical symptoms and so that's where we need to be cautious because a child who is anxious can begin to have stomach pain or rumbling or running like having diarrhea or constipation all because of anxiety okay so they say my stomach hurts or my head hurts or some part of their body hurts and and you check them or the doctor checks them and you can't find any physical physical illness, but whatever they are experiencing is because of anxiety. They may feel their muscles or chest tightening up, you can feel dizzy and well, about to faint. And you know, older, older children, adolescents or young adults can be, begin to feel their heart beating so fast, sweating a lot, and they tremble. Sometimes in a public setting, um, you find them trembling or shaking if they are supposed to stand in front of the class they are shaking trembling all those are anxiety symptoms now these are just to help us have a fair understanding what these signs are but it takes the, the clinician or the trained mental health practitioner to to make sure that the level of these symptoms actually meets the criteria for diagnosing a disorder because every one of us have a right to be anxious at any I mean, point in our day-to-day -day stressful lives. And so anxiety on its own doesn't mean it's, a, it's an illness. However, when anxiety goes you know, overboard and is taking a, having a toll on the individual, it becomes an anxiety disorder. And so that is when we need to intervene and treat um, let's look at ADHD. That is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. This is my, my favorite friend. Because 
Now there are there are three important symptoms in ADHD that I want to just highlight so that we don't classify every child as having ADHD just because they are all jumpy and running about. And again, we always have to put the age and developmental stage of the child into context. So younger children, toddlers, um, be be before four or five years, they are very jumpy, explorative, and it can be all over. And it's because it is a normal developmental stage where children are supposed to explore. But sometimes it is not normal. So in ADHD, for those who have heard or encountered or we probably just heard, it has three important features of inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. And each of these major groups have how you can um, note whether your child has ADHD or not, or may probably be, it may be likely to have. Again, some children may have levels of hyperactive behaviors or inattentive or impulsive behaviors, but it doesn't mean also that they have ADHD because ADHD is a diagnosis, it's a disorder. And so it takes the clinician, the mental health practitioner, the psychiatrist or whoever is evaluating to evaluate and be sure that the number of symptoms the child or signs a child is showing meets the criteria because you must have an, a certain level of these problems and even meet a certain duration of time and how it's affecting the child for us to say that the child has ADHD or not. So it has to be diagnosed. You can't sit at home and diagnose your child. You can just suspect that, no, I think my child often has a hard time concentrating or paying attention. It's always daydreaming. And when in class, the teacher calls the name of the child three times, the child seems to be lost before they they kind of get to know that they are even being called or being spoken to. The child could be easily distracted and frequently disorganized, often forgetful and losing their stuff. Um, and then they don't like things that require mental health, mental efforts. If you put homework in front of the child, it is difficult for the child to sit and attend to the homework. But when they are playing or watching a cartoon or movie, you find that they are happy sitting whatever number of hours to do that. So that's those can, can give you pointers. We have hyperactivity where the child can just not sit still. Those ones are so obvious and overt because you find a child all over, especially when they are supposed to have grown out of that stage, five years, six years, seven years, you find this child is still all over, cannot play quietly, cannot stay seated, is always fidgety in school and in class. The parents or the teachers always complain that the child does not sit. Before you realize they are up, they are moving from one you know, desk to the other. They are moving outside the class to other people's classrooms and all that. Impulsivity, you may find that your child has um, trouble waiting for the attending. They just act without thinking. They bled into conversations. Even adults are talking, they just bled into your conversation. They seem to speak without thinking or do things without really thinking about it. Okay, so these are the classical signs of ADHD. And again, like I said, it's a diagnosable condition. Um, we have the autism spectrum disorder. Now, the ADHD, autism spectrum, intellectual disability are classified uh, with what we call neurodevelopmental disorders. That means that um, they they occur. So they are not just mental health disorders, but they they are they are neurodevelopmental disorders. So pediatricians see them. However, they have as part of their presentation uh, major aspects of it affecting their uh, mental health or having a lot of mental health implications. So basically with autism, you have children who seem not to have good social interaction. They seem not to be able to reciprocate what we expect of them socially that oh, you can chat with them. So a lot of time they have limited speech and it is not maybe because they are deaf or dumb, because a lot of the times you do um, a hearing assessment for these children, you know they can hear clearly. However, they just do not seem to want to talk. So they have limited speech, 
So verbal expression is a problem. Non-verbal expression is a problem because even the facial expressions that you can use or non-verbal cues we use to also communicate, you find that they don't even express those or they don't have them so much. Eye contacts, they may not look at you. You may call your child and they may not respond to their name. Um, you are talking to the child, but they are also only interested in what they are doing. And they like to be alone or play alone. When all children are playing together, you just find them separated and wanting to play alone. And the way they play is also a little bit um, um, stereotyped or in a way that is not usual. So they may not even use the toy for what it should be used for. They may be um, stereotyped or they just have particular ways they want things to be done. So if they are playing with this toy, they just want to arrange the toys in maybe a straight line all the time. Um, if it's a car, instead of maybe wheeling the car around, they just want to disassemble the car parts and maybe leave it. <laughs> so they are, they are, they are Behavior um, kind of point to the fact that there is a problem with how they communicate with us and it, it becomes difficult for us to also communicate with them because especially a lot of them may not talk and when they need something, they may rather throw a tantrum or uh, it, it may be difficult to identify what the child needs. There's, they may exhibit a lot of repetitive behavior. So these are common things in autism. Okay, so i would i would i would highlight something uh, regarding the conduct disorder and then i'll go to what causes some of these problems so with with conduct disorders it's a bit different it is not adhd with conduct disorders you find the child uh, or adolescent mostly engaging in social deviant behaviors so they may lie a lot they may break school rules they may uh, break home rules, stay out of the house for over for overnight. For a younger child, we you know that you no, know, this person has to come back home. But then they stay out. They may join peers and gangs and engage in uh, a lot of substance use uh, abuse. And then, so you find them incriminating the law a lot or breaking big rules. And you find certain um, children or adolescents who would rather. Um, they may actually set fires to property just for shaggy reasons, you know. So that was it's not accidental, it's intentional. So those kind of behaviors point to conduct disorders. And then oppositional behaviors. Oppositional behaviors are kind of a milder version of conduct disorders. So if we call uh, some, another disorder, oppositional defined disorder, where they a child or the adolescent just um, begins to argue with adults or people um, of authority. They seem not to show respect. They are spiteful and vindictive. That means that they 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 always want to you could take a certain revenge on others when it's not appropriate and blame others for their actions. So those behaviors, when persistent, okay, all point to the fact that you know, this child is having some mental health issues. Again, before I continue, let me note that one of behaviors or one-time behaviors does not constitute a mental health disorder. I can, can, can point to some challenges that oh, this child has some mental health challenges or problems we need to address. But for it to become a disorder, it usually has to significantly continue or have been should this that behavior should have showed up a number of times for a couple of months based on whatever the condition that we are talking about most of the time it has to have gone on for six months or more or a month or three months depending on whatever condition we are looking at and then you find that that problem is persistent and it's also affecting their social lives their family lives their school lives or whatever um, life so I know a common question that a lot of us will ask is what causes these mental disorders in children and adolescents? Okay, and again, because uh, we are not able to take each of the individual's uh, disorders and elaborate on them specifically, I'm, I'm generalizing it because this is the principle. 
that various factors interplay to contribute to the development of mental health problems in children and adolescents. So it's not one factor, it's various factors. So when parents ask the doctor that, what caused this in my child? Why is my child having ADHD? So why is my child depressed or having anxiety disorder? Just know that there's no one answer to it. It's usually a number of factors. And for us to understand that, I'll just elaborate on what we call the biopsychosocial model. And also uh, let us look at the ecological model. So what we are saying is that for all these disorders, these three um, factors all play a role together to make that child or adolescent develop the disorder. And so we have biological factors, psychological factors, and social factors all contributing to their mental health. So just elaborating a bit more, biological factors are usually things that you um, mostly cannot control because they are inherent. Mostly it starts from conception, right? When the sperm and egg fertilizes, you know, to form the zygote that will grow and grow and grow to become the baby from that time problems and challenges can occur biologically sometimes things um, developments you know takes uh, complex processes going on cells dividing chromosomes aligning all to form the, the, the individual or the baby who will grow. And sometimes during this process, challenges can occur. Things may not always fall in place. So sometimes we have chromosomal disorders and we have medical inherited disorders, metabolic disorders, which may all happen in the process. And those um, problems can present with some mental health implications when the individual is born. And as they grow, it can show up. Again, some of the mental disorders, you just have an uncertain genetic um, um, course. That means that they you could inherit it from your parents, grandparents, or something somewhere, somewhere in the family line. Okay, the more alike two genetic uh, genes are, the more likely you can pass it on. So most most studies are done with identical twins. When one twin has maybe autism, the other twin is at a higher risk for autism as well. Or if one has ADHD, the other one can have ADHD. For identical twins, why? Because their genes are very similar. And that shows that you can actually inherit or pass you know, it on. Um, parents can pass on certain traits of disorder to their children. Sometimes too, it can just arise without you having known whether anyone had it or not. So biological is quite sometimes difficult you know, to explain. There are things like just your gender, whether you are male or female, can also put you at risk from having one disorder or the other. And things like even your age. And that's why we say that adolescence itself is a risk period. Things like your age, if you fall into the bracket of adolescence, you can be at a high risk of having um, some of the challenges or disorders. Then we have psychological factors. These are usually factors that happen um, or speak about the, the person's innate characteristics, like say their own temperament, their personality, their self-esteem, how they view the world. Things like that may affect or make them at risk of um, having a mental health disorder. So if you have two adolescents, one is a happy, free, outgoing person, one is an introvert and a critical person probably in a stressful situation the happy doesn't care much may endure better than the introvert who is always critical of himself and then that's that difference in their uh, psyche or personality makeup can also make that um, as a, a risk factor for developing a mental health issue and the social factors this is mostly the very obvious things around that's we may prone or may predispose to mental health issues. And a lot of the times we start for children and adults and we start from their very circle, the home. So things happening at home, their upbringing, parental availability. Sometimes there are family dysfunctions. That means parents are fighting. There may be separation and divorce that may not be handled well. That may have uh, an effect on the child. 
even right from when a child is born and growing, if the parent is not available and the child has attachment difficulties, it affects their own uh, social development and that even affects them as adults and they can come down with some mental health challenges. Okay, so as I said, okay, how many minutes do I have? Whilst I try to quickly meet up our time. You, you just speed it up, no problem. Just speed it up so that we can have all time. right. So um we can also look at it in another model that we call the ecological model. This is still talking about the risk factors, the causes, how or why did this child adults and develop this um, disorder? And in this model, we just look at the child being in the in the innermost circle and their environments that shape them surrounding um affecting their mental health. Okay, so individual level is things pertaining to the child, things like, okay, um as some of the things that we spoke in the biological part could come here in the individual because the child is born, is it male, the female, that in its characteristics that the child have some physical illness that is causing strain on them or the the family. If the child probably has a a clean a, a physical illness like uh, epilepsy, that is an illness. That's something of the individual, and that seizures that they keep getting can actually also affect their mental health. The stigma they face can affect them. It can reduce their cognitive ability in school, their learning abilities. So then you can see that problems can arise from the individual level. And again, right from the time they they are conceived, so even the perinatal and antenatal care the child received can ultimately have a bearing on them in their in their their lives growing up. Nutrition, whether they have a disability, poverty, gender, physical or sexual violence, all these are things that the individual can experience and that can affect their mental health. Then their interpersonal level, how are they relating with their family and the immediate environment they live in? What is in the family that is distressing them? Then we look at the community that they are growing in. And remember, most children are in school. So the school community is very important. The neighborhood where they grow up is important. Some grow up in neighborhoods where there are a lot of vices and violence already happening there. So they learn poorly. They, they have bad role modeling. So what they see is what they also pick up. They find people stealing, insulting people all over. And that is the kind of behavior they also pick up. And, and that affects their mental health. If then a, a neighborhood, maybe slum areas like where there are a lot of drug addicts, they can also pick that up and have substance use problems or disorders. Then the bigger environments, like the structural and policy levels, the what 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 is available in the community to protect or stimulate the child? Are there even child and obviously mental health um care facilities available? Yes. So in all, we need to look at risk versus resilience. So the risk factors are the things that we just spoke about. And resilience is the protective factors or the things that can help you to stand and overcome, despite the fact that, oh, you have risk factors. So it doesn't mean that when the risk factors are there, ultimately the illness will show up. And that's also something that we need to understand. When there are risk factors, it may be, overcome by the resilience factors. If, say, a child has a history, there is a family history of depression, a depressive disorder, but the child grew up in an environment that is stimulating, loving, and caring, they may actually be well protected. They have a good social support and everything that could be a protective factor. Then though they have a biological risk of having the condition, the environment protects them, so they may not come down with depression. However, sometimes for other conditions like autism or say ADHD that are, have more of stronger biological influence, the biological influence is greater. So then you may still have autism in the presence of everything being perfect around you. All right, so I'm going to round up so that we can target and answer specific questions. So our next step is to try and promote child and adult mental health. And these are just a few ideas I think we should um, embark on 
public education like what we are doing because we need to more and more and more educate to help reduce stigma, to create the awareness for parents, for teachers, for our, our leaders who make policies to know and give priority to mental and mental health. We must advocate for resources to be channeled for supporting children and adolescents, especially those with mental health disorders, because honestly, the resources are very, very inadequate. And other people can join, the religious bodies can join, voluntary organizations, NGOs can join to help promote through education, through facilitation, uh, establishing support groups, and sometimes even setting up centers where we can train people to offer the services that children and adolescents need. Definitely legal and policy framework to prevent discrimination, rights to assess appropriate interventions. These are the bigger things. But let me come home. I think there, there needs to be a lot of parenting program for child raising because a lot of the other conditions or disorders that are influenced by the environment, like depression, anxiety, substance use problems, conduct disorders, they have a bearing on how the child environment and a lot of parenting techniques are more adaptive. They are not the best. They are not raising children with good mental health, especially in the African setting. I mean, we have good um, cultural practices, but some may also not be stimulating for the child. And especially in our African setting where parents think, oh, the child is just a property, does not know anything. We talk down on children, um, insults, scapegoating them, um, talk down on them to lower their self-esteem even the more that is not enabling for the child so you find this child growing up with a very poor low self-esteem so low self-confidence having a low target for themselves or so, i mean low aspiration for themselves and when they grow up they also become all adjusted individuals they may also exhibit the same pattern to their children there are a lot of parents engage in emotional abuse and neglect without knowing, and that should be addressed. School-based programs are very important. Our children are in schools, and we need to have both education in the schools to educate the teachers to know these uh, mental health problems in school, because sometimes child, children may have difficulties learning, not because they are lazy, but because they have mental health issues or disorders that need to be managed and treated. And we need to start from simple things like healthy diet, feeding the child, giving them good nutrition that can stimulate their brain development and having good stimulating programs for them. Probably we can brainstorm and see what programs can benefit the, the development, the brain development, the emotional development, the social development of our children. So my take home message is that child and adolescent mental health disorders affects more than just the child's brain. Because it affects the whole family, community, and nation. Why? Because the child never grows in isolation. A child is always in a family setting or has to be overseen by a caregiver. Again, the child is usually the window to the family. Now, let me explain this sentence. A lot of the times, when children are exhibiting some behavior issues, emotional issues, or are coming down with a mental disorder, it may indicate something happening in the family that needs to be addressed. Therefore, when we are treating children, we don't treat them in isolation or alone. We bring them into the context of the whole family setting. We understand how, what is going on in the home, what is going on with the parents, what is going on with the siblings. And that may also give you a lot of pointer why the child is having that issue or why they're exhibiting that at the time. Because they are distressed by that family situation and have come down with that, meaning that the help must extend to the entire family. Children are the future leaders in every community or nation, and so protecting their mental health is very important. Now, I look at how some of us were children before and probably the roles that we have to play now. Look at our... Uh, leaders in our various you know, countries, if especially Ghana. So you should know that, okay, so these children are also going to become future leaders. How are we 
forming their mental health so that they can lead well so that we can have you know a better future so i feel that we cannot underestimate um, the mental health promotion in children and adolescents young adults we need to begin to sound the trumpet and begin to work hard towards um, improving their mental health i feel that if we're able to do that maybe we'll have better leaders we will have better um, parents and families in the near future and then we may see better progress and development uh, across board. So I'll end here with a thank you whilst we take questions to keep the discussion ongoing. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Ruth. <clears throat> thank you for um, an extensive presentation. A lot of us are enjoying what you had shared with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of us who have made time to join us as well. Now, it's time for questions. Like I always say, it's a free specialist consultation all right so it's time for questions and dr ruth will gladly answer all the questions that you might have there is already a question in the chat box but i'm asking as many people as possible please drop your questions in the chat box or in a comment section and dr ruth charlotte saki and tia will gladly answer all your questions i have some few questions but i'll start off with the one that is already in the comment section okay let me before that before that <clears throat> For those who join us a little late, please feel free to, okay, I have it here now. Feel free to log on and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Put a notification button on so that when I share the recording of this presentation, you have access to the full package. And most importantly, we want this good news to reach as many people as possible. So help us share it among your friends. Help us share the link. Help us share the recording to as many people as possible. And we have lots of other educational stuff on the channel as well. Help as many people have access to it. It's free and it's online. It's only specialist medical doctors who are featured on this channel. So please feel free. Help us share the good news to as many people as possible. It's question and answers time. First question is, Doc, is some level of anxiety okay? All right, that's a very good question. And yes, some level of anxiety is good. So in in the way we are made, we are made, so we're talking about our, our biological makeup, we are made in such a way that there are certain chemicals that have to be released in times of where we have to take action. So then those chemicals or what we call neurotransmitters help us to identify especially dangers or know that you know, there, there's something at stake, something needs to be done. And then it will bring us to some have some level of anxiety, which is normal, which is very normal, which is actually needful, which is, to use more technical terms, which is physiological or normal for us to function. Imagine you see um, a snake coming to bite you and you are calmly standing and watching it. It can bite you. And even the poisonous snake, you can die. So once you begin to see the threat, the body will release signals that will make you to react. That um, helps you to be safe. Okay, so you may get anxious, start running. If you have exams coming and you are so relaxed and sleeping, thinking there's nothing at stake, you will probably fail the exams. So... Um, we will be made in a way so you know exam is coming. Once the days are approaching more, your the more your anxiety builds because you know you have a short time to maybe finish up your reading. So you you that level of anxiety helps you to be more productive because you try to stay up, try to do what you can to meet the expectations of that exam. So normal levels of anxiety are very important and very good for us to function and be productive. Where it becomes a problem is when it exceeds the normal levels of anxiety. It exceeds the normal levels and rather, instead of being productive, you are now um, shining away from what has to be done. You are fidgety, you are tired, you can't concentrate, you are too worried, you, know, you can't learn. Then that is when um, you have exceeded the, the normal levels of anxiety and you are probably tipping yourself into an anxiety um, disorder, or you are going into distress. 
and that is not good. So very good question. The answer is yes, there is good level of anxiety. It helps us to function um, well and be productive. Okay, Dr. Sedo here. I don't know whether you can hear me. What is the next question? I think you are muted. Sorry, sorry. So the second question is, the person is asking, are there any tools that can be used at home to screen for depression? Okay, that's a very good question. There are several tools. There are several tools to screen for depression for, for both children and adults. Probably we need to um, find more tools responsive to children. Yes, yeah, so we have common ones. Actually, these days with the advent of um, the internet, AI and everything, you can find good tools. But a simple one is the patient health questionnaire, which is a, we have the two item. That means you have only two questions there. Then we have the nine item where you have nine questions to answer, which can just screen quickly and let you know whether there is some possibility that there can be depression. I mean, for both children, young adults and adults. There are also specific ones for just children, um, which are still available or accessible. So we have things like the kidney schedule of affective disorders, the screening tool version. That one is made to just screen for the depression in the children and then Afterward, if it shows that no, the, the person can be at risk of depression, we go on to, you can then now be referred to see a mental health practitioner or your doctor or whoever to diagnose and start management. So there are, I'm sure I would leave some for Dr. Sadovia to share those, those tools to us. Yes, but you can Google some and still get some good ones to use to screen. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. And now there's a, a, a very uh, good question here as well. Someone says, I have a child who is four years old, very brilliant orally, but doesn't enjoy writing. Because of that, the school wants to fail him. Is this normal? Is the school being fair? Okay. Very, very, very important question and it's unfortunate um, how sometimes the schools handle these things. That's why we need to incorporate some mental health education into our education curriculum. Because I mean, I didn't elaborate on the specific learning disorders, but we have learning disorders where a child is very good intellectually, does not have any intellectual developmental issue. They are brilliant, however, there are different modalities for learning. Of course, the common ways we learn are reading, writing, I mean, verbally expressing, and then moving on to mathematics, calculation. Yeah, so when children have, they do well in other areas of learning, but do not do well in some areas of learning, then it means they are having a specific learning problem or disorder. So this child who is brilliant and can answer orally everything, but is not able to write, there could be two problems of the child. The, the person with the child is obviously having a learning disorder. It could be dyslexia or dysgraphia. Dysgraphia is where a child just cannot write because of some neurological malfunction some way. So they can probably read it but when they have to put the pen or pencil or paper and write, that becomes a difficulty. Of course, usually we have to um, evaluate the child holistically and rule out other things, make sure there's no motor weakness, there's no, um, yeah, there's no problem with coordinating their hand movements and all that. We have to assess the child holistically to rule all that out um, and be sure the child can see clearly as well. Because if the child has a visual impairment and can't see clearly, they probably cannot um, write also clearly. So we need we rule all those out. And when everything is fine, yes, then it could be a specific learning disorder like dysgraphia. And dyslexia for those who 
seem not to be able to um, read out what has been written, though they can verbally and orally express themselves so brilliantly and so well. If you conduct an oral exam for them, they will beat everybody in their school. I mean, the same probably questions that you have given, but if you are supposed to put the paper in front of them to read and answer, which is like the traditional way most of our educational system employs to assess children, then you may find them struggling or having a difficulty. And that's not because they are dumb or they are not brilliant, but because they have that specific problem. Unfortunately, we have very few resources of trained teachers or people who can help children with dyslexia. But the children with dyslexia, dysgraphia, or other types of specific learning disorders will have to have um, like a trained teacher who is good with helping children with dyslexia um, to be able to pick up. Because sometimes there are other, I'm not an educationist, but there are other, there are psychological, uh, educational psychologists and um, therapists who do well with helping use some other creative means to help that child with that difficulty. And we need to open up our educational system to not to be rigid that, oh, everybody has to be, to be assessed with pen and paper answer these questions. We should have been able to accommodate children like that, that they can, they can, I mean, present their knowledge through other means like oral presentation. So I just wish um, whoever had that question, I just wish you could speak to the teacher or the head and ask if there are any available help for children having that kind of specific um, challenge or problem. You could also reach out. I'm sure Dr. Sedo here can help you and we can direct you to some um, professionals for the child to be assessed first. And then when we are sure it is a problem of dyslexia or dysgraphia, we can make some recommendations. Yes, it's it's just unfortunate that our system are not is not fully resourced and some of these children are just... Um, targeted by the schools that's not doing well and sometimes they want to be moved out but it shouldn't be the case all right all right thank you very much that was a very good question a very, a very brilliant response yes of course so you can reach me on whatsapp and i will gladly point you uh, in the right direction to expect to help assess the child and we will give the best help that is available to the child as well there's a question which is just for clarification, that throughout your presentation, you've been using the word management, management instead of cure. Are you trying to say there is no cure for autism, depression, ADHD, and all the conditions you mentioned? That's mm -hmm. the question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where to start from on this one. <laughs> yeah, so it's a very brilliant question. So yes, management. Um, so when we talk about a lot of mental health disorders, unfortunately, I didn't get, I didn't really tackle that, but I knew it will come up in our discussion. So the same, I'll try and share that. Um, share the the diagram that was using the biological, psychological, and social approach again, just to let us know that in managing mental health disorders, we still use the same approach based on its causes. So we tackle it from the biological, psychological, and social approach together because we've already found that the causes is not one, one cut angle where I can do this, just this, or give this drug and then it, everything is gone. No, because it's complex. It's a complex interplay of different factors. So when you are in quotes, treating or managing or curing, you still have to look at this three-pronged approach. You may, for the biological um, driving illnesses or disorders, we may have to see for depression, anxiety, um, there are good um, medications in terms of biological treatments that have been, that are available, that can help the child or adolescent or even adults um, be able to be, recover from their depression. And sometimes the, the individual may be fine or in quotes may be cured where they don't have the problem again, but we would rather safely not say that they are cured. They are treated, they recover, they are able to get back to their lives. 
but because those risk factors are generally or not all the time eradicated, some of the risk factors you can't you can't stop being a female. You can't um you can't change your hormones. Like there are things that are there you cannot change, and there are stresses around that. Some you can change, some you can't. So you can still be at risk for future events. So we manage, and that's a better term to use. If we manage today for a period of time, and the individual is fine, it's great. Then we go to the preventive methods where we try to prevent the individual or child from having that reoccurrence. However, there are other conditions like autism that cannot be cured because of how it's biological making, how that influence is so strong and how it is wired genetically. And you usually can't go down and genetically change it. So it makes it difficult to come up with something that changes the person. It's complex. So we're able to manage and see progress. And it applies to the neurodevelopmental conditions. That means the problem arises during brain development. So something has gone on in the wiring. And we don't have any currently um, though there are some new um, breakthrough kind of methods that are being experimented. We haven't yet fully um, engraved those things. I know a, a parent has asked me recently about uh, stem cell transfer. Said we had a friend of hers who went to India to or somewhere to have a stem cell transfer. So she thinks she wants to take a child with autism and hopefully see whether the child can start becoming more communicative or yeah, um, more verbal. So those experiments are still in the progressive stages. So we can't be 100% sure of them. Yes, some are, see are seeing some results. Okay, even then, after that is done, it's not a cure because that child still is undergoing other treatments and therapy because it's developmental. The child is still developing. So the, the condition is still, I mean, improving. So that's how a lot of the times we take these um, problems, how to understand them and how to tackle them. Again, when you get to the point where the challenges that were there are overcome, you are happy. You know, now we've, we've, we've been able to overcome this level. What's the next step was the next challenge if everything is resolved hallelujah if not then it means that treatment continues so um my dear friend that's a bit i can say we manage for some years you can cure um or treat and then probably the person can be fine without having to continue ongoing treatments for for long um it depends on the condition it depends on how it has come about um but a lot of them may require some form of ongoing treatment. Treatment doesn't mean medications alone. It may mean the social support. It may mean psychological care or psychotherapy or something of that sort. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, I, I, I want you to make a... Um, what would be your comment on the parenting style in terms of um, <clears throat> corporal punishment in our setting? What would be your comment as an expert, child and adolescent uh, mental health expert, would you agree that children need some level of correct, correction in terms when they go wrong or you are with the view that they should be left, um, nothing should be done? And what, what will be your comment? Okay, very important, a very interesting question. So children definitely need um, a level of correction, supervision, uh, monitoring, disciplining. Um. I usually have a, a lecture I do on parenting types and how each of those types could affect the child for the positive or the negative. So just to highlight um, the four main types of parenting that have been propounded by psychologists, not me. So we have the authoritative, authoritarian, the neglectful parents and the permissive parents. And so just as a brush up the Authoritarian is the one who does not give the child any space. It's like a very demanding parent, but the parent is not responsive. So does not give the child any emotional affection or respond to the child's needs, but it's always demanding from the child and 
you have no say. If you do wrong, you, you'll be whipped and you can't complain. So that kind of parenting has an outcome for the child where the child can also come up or they grow up as they grow up as adults, you also find some more adaptiveness in such a person because they are always um in quotes somehow pushed down. And so as they become adults, they have low self-esteem, low self-confidence, they can't make decisions on their own, but they are very moralistic. They want to stick to the rule because they dare not. Okay, so it has its advantages and disadvantages. Authoritarian parent, the author so then we have authoritative. So the authoritative parents, let me talk about that one last because that is more like the balanced one. The neglectful parent, the neglectful parent is, I don't care about my child, whether they have eaten, whether they have not. Uh, that parent is not demanding and is not responsive. They just need the child alone. And definitely that's a very ill-mannered way of parenting. And it leads to very bad outcomes for such an individual as they grow up. They will also, they'll be more, mostly more adjusted. And they, because their, their training was just liberal, everything goes. You find them, they are the ones that can have conduct disorders, um, substance abuse problems. And I mean, definitely they grow up to not become well formed adults and have proper relationships. Then we have the permissive parent. The permissive parent is, say, is, is very caring. Um, so they are responsive, but they are not demanding. So what is demanding? The demandingness means check their child when they have to correct them, make them responsible for their actions, discipline them when you have to. So permissive is, you know, you, I'm caring for your needs, I'm providing for you and all, but I, I'm not expecting anything from you. So you are free to do what you want. That is also not good, you know. So you get wasteful characters because they get everything they want, but nobody disciplined them. Definitely that is a no-no. Then we have the authoritative parent. So that is the parent that bridges the two, where they are demanding and at the same time they are responsive. So they are responsive to care for your needs, meet up with you. They don't only stand in the one way authoritarian that I've said it and that is the end. They are able to, they're responsive to the child, know the child's own take and then they start together to come to a compromise. And then they're also demanding. So they instill in it, the necessary discipline from the necessary boundaries. The child goes wrong. That, that parent is sure to correct the child. So the balance must definitely be there. And in correction, that's when we talk about the types of child rearing or raising techniques. In correction, we, we in Africa, we are just, um, <laughs> that's one of our surest way, the corporal punishment. But the thing is, that is not the only thing. We realize that if you, a lot of parents in, in attempting to discipline their child with corporal punishment end up in child abuse. And that's another very important subject of mental health discourse for another day. Because many children are being physically abused, not intentionally, but it's being done because the parent is exerting um, control over their child by punishing them. And sometimes you, the parent, could be, you could go overboard because the child is irritating you and you attempt to discipline them properly, you can hurt and injure the child. See, with this child abuse, the child is beaten with a large or whatever in a way that physically puts them in danger. So don't beat your child out of a lot of um so much, so much hurt to injure them. And the thing with corporal punishment is that because it has become so in vogue. With time, it's losing its power because then if you are not, if you only use that and forget other evidence-based approaches to discipline your child, then the child comes to the point where, I mean, I've had enough. What is it? They, they have actually prepared their body and waiting for the king and it doesn't reform them. Okay, so corporal punishment is good. I think we need to categorize it um, and begin to designate it to our last resort or not our always go-to resort so that it cannot it does not lose its significance or they don't get overused to it now i mean when you beat a child what are the things that could happen in their minds okay my my father and mother is correcting me i need to stop this but with time because a lot of parents do may not be 
also having the, the, the full um, training and go overboard, even for things that the child doesn't need a corporal punishment, you just you just in, in, inflict it on the child. And with time, the child gets emotionally abused. And so they get um, all these emotional problems, which are not voiced out. They are in, in, in it or they are suppressed within. And that makes them or that gives them mental health issues later. But there are a lot of good ways to discipline and also to instill good behaviors in your child. And that is what we, we train. And there, there is what we call the operant conditioning. The way you, you are able to punish, either by not punish alone, but the way you're able to instill a, a good character in a child is either by rewarding the child so that they know that this behavior is good. I, I get praised whenever I do this. I get a hand clap. My parents tell me I've done well. So praises are something we don't know how to do, especially as, as, as Africans. We need to learn to do it because the more you praise someone, we, we think that the more you beat someone, the more they stop whatever they want to do. But there is a better yield when you praise someone or you reward someone or you acknowledge that you've done well. That works on their mind for them to do that good thing more and more compared to when you beat. When you beat, it's just a fear that, hey, next I shouldn't do this because I'll be beaten. So it doesn't have the same impact. So yes, it has good impact in its way. But let's, let's put all the possible methods together. Let's learn how to reward our children when they do well, praise them. Let's learn the use of negative punishment. Negative punishments are removing things that they like from them. So if the child has access to watch cartoons, play with a TV or tablet or whatever, and you want to punish them, you can deny them their privileges for a time. When you deny them their privileges for a time, you let them know it's because of that ill behavior. And so with time over and over again, whenever they know when they do that activity that is not helpful, they are going to be denied what they like. Maybe everybody is going, the family is going on outing, but they are not going to be taken along. They are going to be left behind because of that behavior. With time, they will learn. Then that's negative punishment. So it's not just beaten, beaten, always whipping, always. Whipping is good. Let's designate it to a time when we have instituted the others and then the others are not working because it can also be emotionally abusive towards a child. Thank you very much. That was an extensive expose on the parenting styles. We all need it. Most of us were brought up in the authoritarian way, the typical African way. So thank you very much for clarifying and letting us know the pros and the cons of the different parenting styles. Of course, definitely neg neglectful type is definitely not allowed. The permissive way mm -mm, and the authoritarian no. So we should all aim at the authoritative kind of parenting, which is a balanced one where the parents are both responsive and demanding as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Ruth. Now, I want to ask another question. I'm asking questions because this is what a lot of people ask around. Now, for ADHD, do children grow out of it? ADHD, autism, do they grow out of it? Dyslexia, do they grow out of it? Sometimes, do they? Okay, good question. So remember the use of the term neurodevelopmental. That means that things are progressing and not static. So these conditions you've mentioned are all neurodevelopmental. Like I said, it starts right from even conception and then it continues and develops. So as the child is developing, if they had a challenge and we're able to institute certain management and techniques, they can improve and improve and improve. And then one challenge may drop to the next, to the next, to the next. So you can actually come to the point where you may have not much challenges to worry about. It doesn't uh, remove the fact that, say, the child has grown out of the autism. Because sometimes there may be a few traits that may still be there, especially with how they are socially you know, responsive to people around. You may just have the traits. Uh, it's interesting how it's known that certain renowned scientists who brought very great discoveries were autistic. But probably the challenges they had as children as they grew, and then, well, most of the time, common um, behavior of adults as autistic is probably not to be as sociable. So, fine. So, it doesn't mean that at that point they they are, or they, it doesn't mean that at that point that the person is no longer having autism, they, they are having it, 
but then they are not of, there is no problem or challenge to, to be considered or to worry about the moment. Now, other things like ADHD, yes, it's the same principle. And a lot of the time, especially for ADHD, people may grow out of it. Why? Because how ADHD works in the brain is such that the, with time and brain development, natural development, the problem can subside because the frontal part of the brain where ADHD occurs is the last place to develop and it develops after adolescence, like between 18 to 20 years before it has fully developed. So when the child already has that deficit and he's still developing with time, when the natural development is still ongoing, they may have less of the challenges they were having as children. But there are others who will grow up with their ADHD as well and you find traits of it and how it's affecting their lives, especially when they did not get any intervention or they did not get any management. So yes, it's the, the, the question doesn't have a one direct answer. For some, you can actually could grow out of it. And for some, you will have to still be managing it for some with development things will get better and then maybe for some you may probably not see anything about it and it all depends on the kind of disorder and also the the interventions you have gotten that has helped you to overcome those challenges that you had yeah yeah thank you very much so this is very typical when you talk to expert they don't just make categorical statement they get you the whole picture all the other aspect that you may not be um and considering thank you very much dr rose charlotte saki and tia thank you very much and if there are any last questions please drop it in the chat box or the comment section and she'll gladly help us with that we have almost out of time but if you have any last questions please drop it in the chat box in the comment section so that she can gladly answer you before we sign off and for those of you who join us a little late Please feel free, subscribe to the YouTube channel. I've dropped it in the comment section on the Zoom link. Subscribe to the channel, put the notifications button on, and most importantly, when the recording is dropped, please help us share to as many people as possible. Everybody is excited and happy about the presentation that Dr. Saki gave us this afternoon, and everybody is saying it's been a brilliant presentation. It's been very um, self-explanatory, and you've done a good job. It, everybody is happy about that's why there are very few questions but if anybody has any last minute questions please drop it in the chat box or in the comment section for dr ruth to kindly deal with it for us and in the absence of any questions please dr ruth we are grateful okay somebody said um all right like everybody is saying you are just phenomenal everybody is happy about the presentation thank you very much so in the absence of any questions please <clears throat> what will be your last um words to us okay so i think i gave my take home message but i'll reiterate it uh, my last words are that children and adolescents are very important group of people when it comes to mental health they are the future of the nation we are the future of every society we are the future of um, every family and so we need to start looking at child and adolescent mental health promotion, prevention. And I'm very sure maybe in the next 10 years, if we're able to strategically put things in place, more education education and educative sessions like this in place, and people are trained and we help our children to have better mental health, I'm sure in the next 10 years, hopefully there'll be better spouses, better parents, better leaders of our countries, better everything. So. Um, child and adult mental health is very important. Again, if you have encountered any challenge as a parent of your child or you are a child or adolescent yourself, please, 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 help is available. Kindly get in touch. I'm sure if you don't have anywhere to go, at least you have Dr. Sedoria's channel, you can reach out and then I'm sure he will be able to direct you accordingly to some of the helpful resources and persons that are available. Thank you for having me. And Enjoy your weekend. We are very grateful. We are grateful for you. And I'm sure I'm sure that's your father, Mr. Sam Hayford. Is that your father? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> your father is very proud of me. He's making us know he's very proud of me. Yes, you're a big daddy girl. So thank you very much, Mr. Sam Hayford. Daddy. 
Thank, um, thank you. you very much, Dr. Ruth Shalosaki and uh, We are grateful for a wonderful presentation, in-depth knowledge exposure. Thank you very much. And of course, as time goes on, we'll call you back to help us with other topics as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And of course, we're going to make the recording immediately available so that we can all share with all our friends because she touched on a lot of very important topics, very, very important topics. She took her time. That's why I didn't cut her off. She took her time to give us detailed information and the things that we need to know. You know, I'm wearing purple. So May is now designated as what? Purple Month, where we have mental health awareness creation nationwide by the Mental Health Authority. So that's part of the activities we are going through. So we want more people to know, especially if we just coming down to the parenting style. A lot of us, <clears throat> we deal to our children what we were dealt with, because that's all we know. But we don't know the pros and the cons of what we are doing to our children. So we are going to make this available to as many people as possible by sharing the link, sharing the recording. And of course, as time goes on, inviting Dr. Ruth Charlotte to come again to give us more in that knowledge on other topics. Thank you very much to and to every one of you that made time to join and Mr. Sam Hayford as well for joining. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. And next week, we have an amazing presentation coming up and that's going to talk about the workplace mental health. So you see, last week we dealt with maternal mental health. This week we are dealing with child and adolescent mental health. Now, now, when they grow, they start working, right? So next week, we're going to deal with workplace mental health. And then the following week, we will continue. Thank you very much. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel and put the notifications button on. Until we meet again next week, it's been a plum, pleasing pleasure serving you all. Enjoy your weekend.